Please welcome to the stage Orange is the New Black author Piper Kerman, Reform Alliance CEO Robert Rooks, and New York Times magazine writer Emily Bazelon. Thank you so much for joining us this morning um, for this amazing session with two people who are incredibly thoughtful about um, the criminal justice, the criminal legal system, and all its uh, flaws. I'm Emily Bazelon. I'm a staff writer at the New York Times Magazine. Um, to my right is Piper, Piper Kerman, who is probably lots of people here know, is the author of Orange is the New Black. Um, if you are a Piper fan, you'll be happy to know that she is soon planning to turn in her manuscript for her next book, um, which will be, yeah, good. That's a good, it's good to get a round of applause before it's even done. <laughs> I need all the encouragement I can get. Piper has been teaching for the last five years in a prison in Ohio, and so that is the subject of the book. Um, and I'll um, I'll leave for uh, her next panel the question of when it will come out, but you can look for a publication date in the, hopefully the near future. Um, and Robert Rooks uh, is also here happily joining us. He is the CEO of Reform Alliance and also the founder of a really important group you should all look out for called Alliance for Safety and Justice. Um, and also crime survivors. Um, so thank you both so much for being here this morning. Um, I want to start by framing the conversation in this way. So um, we have had a movement in this country to end mass incarceration, and it is making some progress, although not as fast as I think the people on this stage and a lot of people in the room would want. Sometimes the um, desire to really radically shrink the size of the criminal legal system is pitted in an adversarial way against the needs um, of victims and survivors of crime. And it's as if those two, two groups are kind of opposed to each other. In fact, they are groups that with enormous overlap. Very often, people who commit crimes, especially violent crimes, have been victimized previously by violence, and that is helping to inform the situation that they're in. So, Robert, how do you think about this question of um, what role, what needs the, um, the victims and survivors of crime often have, and how should we think about that as we're trying to deeply reform and change this um, huge system that we've inherited. Awesome. Uh, first of all, Emily, thank you uh, for moderating this panel. And Piper, always good uh, to be in your presence. Um, and the citizen, this is amazing. You know, pulling all these people together to have uh, this conversation. It's, it's really good to be in the presence of, of people and, and feel the connection. Um, when I think about your, your question, Emily, I, I think about just how long we've come um, as a movement, as a field. You know, I've been doing this work for upwards of 20, 23 years. I remember a time when you could basically put everyone doing criminal justice reform work in a hotel room like this um, and to see where the conversation is at now is truly exciting and inspiring, and I'm proud of it. When I think about the discussion regarding crime victims and victims and people that have committed crime um, being put in direct opposite of each other, it, it's, it's deeply upsetting to me. Um, it's upsetting because it's not my experience at all and it's not why I do the work. I grew up in Dallas in the 80s and 90s at a time when I saw my working class community really fall apart right in front of my eyes. I, in 1980, we um, you know, had you know, a TV repair guy. We had TV repair guys back then. I don't know, some of y'all may, <laughs> may not know anything about that, but we had a TV repair guy across the street. We had a mechanic, you know, we had uh, my, my dad was a minister. We had a social worker. It was truly a working class neighborhood. Um, but 1983, everything changed. Um, the neighborhood fell apart because of the influx of addiction. And what came later after addiction um, was violence. And I saw moms who had lost a son to prison 
and a son to the cemetery asked for help, and there was no help there. I saw moms who asked for help for mental health and addiction, even my own family asking for help, and there was no help there. And so I experienced a situation where victimization was high um, and government um, support um, was non-existent. And so uh, systemic and structural neglect is how this all started. Um, but then came the batons and cells. Uh, and so where they didn't have support and resources for us for what we needed, they had a prison cell. And so there is no dichotomy um, between victims and people who committed a crime. We're talking about the same people, the same community, same families. Thank you for that. Um, Piper, how do you think about this question of... Um, is it, or should we be talking about fixing the criminal legal system or moving outside of it? And how do you think of this question of victims and survivors and the role that they may be playing? Yeah, I mean, increasingly, as every year goes by, my focus is on shrinking the criminal legal system. And shrinking the crim criminal legal system means uh, moving money, moving resources out of those systems, out of policing systems, out of you know courts and and lawyers, and out of prisons, out of probation, and into the community. And it's uh, an acknowledged remedy that has been incredibly difficult politically to make any progress on. So, you know. Robert's been doing this work a long time. I've been doing this work a long time. I am delighted that the rhetoric around the criminal legal system has altered, although some of these old tropes are very effective in terms of defending the status quo, and we're seeing that right now in places like Philly and in cities all over the country. Um, so the rhetoric has changed, but we know that the needle has not really budged in terms of the numbers of people who are being criminalized. And so uh, when we look at who's being criminalized, we do see that almost everyone who's being criminalized has been the victim of harm. They have been shot, they have been stabbed, they have been assaulted, they have been raped. Um, and so when I teach, you know, in addition to my own experience being incarcerated, you know, when I teach in a women's state prison in Ohio and a men's medium security prison in Ohio, almost every single one of my students is a survivor of harm and harm that we typically label as crime. So we spend $100 billion a year on policing we spend $80 billion a year on prisons. We have, you know, these systems aren't working. They aren't working, and we know they're not working because not only do we have anecdotes and stories that explain why they're not working, but the data shows that the, that the existing status quo is not working. Um, I know that I shared with you, and I'm sure you're familiar with it, that the Federal Bureau of Justice Statistics has been keeping data on crime survivors for, since 1975. And that is, you know, where our crime data comes from is, you know, something we could sink into. <laughs> it's a morass. But that particular survey goes directly to the public and says, and asks them about their own experience with harm and violence. And what it showed in the, the last data set, which I believe was 2020, was that close to 60% of people who survive assault, rape, you know, violent crime of some sort, robbery, do not report to the police, right? The, the majority of people who survive violence trust the system so little that they don't report. This is a failed system, so the idea that we're going to put more resources and more money into the status quo is folly. Um, but we do need to listen to survivors of harm, first and foremost, because they're the people who know what they need. They're the people who know how what happens to them might have been prevented. And, you know, if we get to people much sooner, if we help people much earlier, 
we will interrupt those cycles. Because if you spend any time in a prison, <laughs> sooner or later, someone's going to say to you, hurt people hurt people. And you hear it again and again and again. And yet, we seem to lack the will to really do things differently. And there are really specific reasons around race and around economics and you know who gets what and who owns resources and who controls resources that explain why this sort of perplexing question of why we don't can't do better and do different. Right. So I think once you kind of recognize the power of this overlap between victimization and committing acts of violence, you kind of open the door to thinking differently about solutions, which obviously is a theme of this event. Um, and I wonder, Robert, in your work right now, there are different ways of thinking about um, what solutions to start with in particular, because it can seem like just such a massive task. And I wonder what you see as the things that you are making a priority um, in your role at the head of this big organization. Oh, wow. I, I, I will approach that um, in a couple of ways. One, uh, building on the theme of, of this conference, right? Ideas, um, you should steal. I'm going to steal an idea and share it with you. Uh, Vinny Sherardi, who we we were talking about earlier, he and I did a class about two weeks ago. And he posed a very interesting question to the, to, to the class that I'm gonna to pose uh, to you to start this conversation off. Uh, Vin, Vinny basically said, you know, we need to take it into account um, that the people that end up in the justice system are people that have had real issues. Like a lot of them have had, you know, um, issues with addiction, issues, not all of them, of course, but by and large, a good number have had real issues um, in their lifetime. So if you take that to account and you take the $80 billion that Piper shared that goes into prisons each and every year, and you take that off the table and you say, hey, how would you address these issues that people are facing? What type of system would you build? Like, what type of system would you build? I don't think anyone here or I, I firmly believe, I don't believe law enforcement would answer that we would build what we have right now. Like, I, I, I don't believe that. What we have right now is broken. It doesn't work for victims. It doesn't work for people uh, formerly incarcerated. It doesn't work for communities. It doesn't work for anyone. And so we need to go back to square one thinking around what we should be doing and what system we should be building to respond to the needs of today. And, and so I just want to kind of share that first and foremost. The second thing I'll share is Akila Shirils, who was just on the previous panel, my, my brother, he and I co-founded Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice together. And in that work, we m met with crime victims all up and down California and then across the country. We, we, we met with them to talk about what they wanted out of the justice system. They told us three things. One, they want what happened to them not to happen to them again. Two, they want what happened to them not to happen to anyone else. And three, they want help and investment in their community. So if you want to know where to go for square one, talk to the people that's been impacted. They'll give you the way. Um, Piper, are there particular ways of thinking about solutions of how to build uh, prevention and address root causes that lie outside of our current system that you are focused on right now? Sure. Uh, it's very important to remember, particularly in the face of things like the current homicide rates in, in Philadelphia, that punishment is not the same thing as prevention. And that is a really hard thing for people to grapple with on a gut level, not on a rational level, on an emotional level. You know, when harm is caused, there is a very human response around punishment. And the idea that punishment is the same thing as accountability or that those two are exactly the same. And also around the idea that if we just punish enough, that things will change, but there's ample, like, you know, mountains and mountains and mountains of evidence that punishment is not prevention. So we can have a discussion about whether, you know, and, and I do not purport to speak for every survivor of harm, right? Some survivors of harm 
really want punishment, and that's something to discuss in a substantive way. But the idea that punishment, you know, is the same thing as prevention is very specious. It's just flat out wrong. So remedies that are actually preventative, that will actually save people from having to endure harm, are the things that we should look at. And those happen way downstream. So it's extremely important if someone is harmed that the person who did the damage is, you know, the word we often use is caught, quote unquote, caught. I know that the clearance rate in Philadelphia for, you know, gun homicides is, I think, less than 15%. So, you know, <laughs> uh, so people can't trust the system to even sort of, quote unquote, catch the person who's doing harm often. Um, but the most important thing is to, you know, you know, that's not a system that has a lot of credibility, you know, so we have to get at things that will surface those, those problems much, much sooner, much further downstream, when harm at, frankly, a, a less, a lower level is happening. So some of those things happen inside the system, right? So there's a couple of different responses to what's happening in our communities. Some of them happen you know, in cooperation with the criminal legal system. So I sit on the board of the Women's Prison Association, which is based in New York City, which has been doing work with, you know, criminalized women and their families since the 1840s. We would love to go out of business. That would be our greatest sign of success. And we uh, launched a program in 2013 called Justice Home, in which women who are facing uh, a year or more in jail or prison were in cooperation with their district attorney and their judge given the opportunity to remain at home with their families because they all have families, they all have kids. That's not a requirement to be in the program, but it's a reality. And to deal with accountability around their crime of conviction, but also to get what they needed to make the changes in their lives that were necessary. And it varies. Some people have substance use problems. Some people, you know, have need parenting classes. Some people need, you know, food stability and, and safe and stable housing. Every woman is different, but the program has been profoundly successful, you know. And the cost of that program, well, the cost in New York State of incarcerating a person is a minimum of $50,000 a year. And if, a per if that woman has two kids and is the sole head of household and both those kids go into foster care, all of a sudden the cost has ballooned to over $130,000 a year. And Justice Home costs about $18,000 per year per participant, but that always is you know, serving an entire family. So like you do the math, right? You, know, you can do the math if all, if all you care about is dollars and cents, but also if you just do the broader question of what change have we created in that family, in that community, it's profound. So that's a remedy that is in the system from my point of view because that's in collaboration with courts and prosecutors. But the remedies that we really, that are most exciting and most interesting to me are the ones that lie outside of the system because as Robert described, you know, when when things either begin to fall apart or when in fact you have generations of dysfunction in you know, a community or in a family, the remedies that they need are really not within the criminal legal system and they don't belong in the criminal legal system. So, and we're seeing that happen. So uh, there's a website I'll offer because you can go and you can see a slew of things that people are doing in communities all around the country and that is, I just wanna get it right, the project is, or the, the, the compendium is called One Million Experiments. The URL is millionexperiments.com. And you'll notice that those, uh, those community-based responses to harm and violence, very focused on prevention, are uh, co happening in places like Minneapolis and Chicago and other places that have been plagued with both violence in communities, but also with profound violence from the police. And so in the wake of the murder of George Floyd by the police, 
many, many projects have sprung up all over Minneapolis to respond to what's going on in communities in ways that do not rely on the criminal legal system. And, and who could blame them? Who could blame those communities, right? And those, you know, there, there's, a, there's a long list of them, and they're fantastic, and they're doing very difficult work, and, and not always, um, and, you know, not soft work, if you will. They are addressing serious harm in their communities. Um, I'm just going to support, give a little uh, empirical support for the approach you're talking about. There's a sociologist uh, at Princeton named Pat Sharkey who did this really interesting, I still think kind of underappreciated study a few years ago where he looked at community-based nonprofit organizations all over the country. And he was able to show that when a new organization opens in a neighborhood, um, you can actually see a drop in the homicide rate a kind of cause and effect finding, which is really unusual in his field. And what he showed was that it's not just organizations that directly work on violence prevention. It's like cleaning up the park. It's opening a community center. Um, it's having just all the avenues for youth, particularly in poor communities, that middle-class families want for their kids. There's a kind of similarity there, which is very unsurprising, I think, when you um, really consider it. Um, Piper, you brought up the rise in the homicide rate, which is true in Philadelphia. It's also true nationally right now. And I'm glad that you did that because I think it's important to kind of directly address that we're in this moment of, um, of murders in particular rising. And as a country, we have not succeeded in continuing with reform and reducing incarceration in previous eras when crime rises. We tend to get scared and to think that punishment is um, a form of prevention or in kind of desperation turn to it even if we know that it's failing. So um, how, Robert, I know this is a big question for you, but um, how do we keep that from happening this time? Yeah, we, we need a clear call to action around solutions. Uh, we need a clear call to action around what the types of things that Piper was just speaking about, what types of programs uh, that help address the underlying causes of crime. Uh, we, we need those right now because that's what we need to point to in the wake of this, this conversation. My fear is that if we don't have those solutions, um, then the answers, especially in the media, become uh, quite obvious for them, right? It's like, oh, crime's gone up. Let's put more police on the street. I would say crime's gone up. Let's put more interventionists, peace interventionists on the street, right? Like crime's gone up. Let's open up more, 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 more boys and girls clubs and parks. Or oh, crime's gone up. Let's let's actually get people jobs and clear pathways to employment and stability, right? Those are things that like you will hear from us. How do we ensure that it becomes part of what the mainstream is talking about? So we need, we need a clear call to action. We need a constituency that understands this and is able to talk about it. We need elected leaders that understand this and then actually put resources in the budget and incentivize these programs, right? And we will see a collateral impact in terms of reduction of crime. So I just want to bring in the kind of anomalous factor of the pandemic here because we've seen this particular type of violent crime rise in this moment where the country was Conf confronting, you know, a, we hope once in a century crisis in which things like boys and girls clubs shut down mm -hmm. in cities and kids and young people had fewer alternatives. There's been, you know, a tremendous disturbing rise in mental health problems for youth and teenagers and people in their 20s. And I, I just want to bring that in because I think it's important to remember that while this spike is alarming, it is happening under this particular context, which is a very unusual one. Um, and bringing back all these resources, um, folks in the community who work to try to prevent violence by interrupting it, um, you know, when they know there are people who are beefing with each other, a lot of that work was itself interrupted and um, getting it restarted, putting resources into can that. I, can I just important. say two, yeah. two things about that? I mean, what the pen, I, I really appreciate you building it, bringing that up. What the pandemic taught us is what happens to us as a people when we're isolated Right, we need, to, we need to understand that the current criminal justice system is about isolation, right? That we need to support those things that are as about inclusivity, that's about bringing people in, that's about community and connection. 
So I, I just wanted to, to, I really appreciate you bringing that up. And just, that's just a, a, another reason why we need to support those types of programs. That is a really good point. Thank you for picking up on that. Um, Piper, can you tell us a little bit about some of the stories of the men I think you're working with now in prison or you have been working with and how that intersects with some of these questions we're talking about? Yeah, I mean, um, so I taught in a men's medium security state prison in Ohio for almost five years. And... Most of my guys there, and also most of the women in the women's prison, uh, had been convicted of serious, what we would characterize as serious crimes, in other words, crimes in which they victimized another person. Some of my students, you know, like me, had sort of drug trafficking, drug selling related offenses, but the majority of my students um, had crimes of violence. And of course I got to know these guys incredibly well because it was a narr personal narrative nonfiction writing class. They were literally writing their own lives. And that was illuminating for me and I think also incredibly illuminating for them. I think about, you know, one of my favorite students is Lafayette and uh, Lafayette is sort of, uh, he calls himself Baby T. He does look a little bit like Mr. T. You know, he's quite stacked diesel, and, uh, and he's an, a brilliant, you know, improbably positive person because he had an extraordinarily difficult life, uh, raised in the mean streets of Cleveland. And when he was nine years old, his mother became addicted to crack cocaine, and the family began to disintegrate in a host of ways. You know, they had a writing prompt of write about a memorable meal, and he wrote this devastating story about you know, basically feeding his two younger siblings because his mom, you know, had essentially, from his perspective, you know, he once used the phrase, she left us. And his mom, you know, did eventually recover, but it took a long time. And nine years old is also, I, you know, Lafayette had once written this amazing story about the first time he stole a car and like the ensuing car chase, you know, through the streets of Cleveland, which is very dangerous. Um, he has an incredibly exciting way of telling a story, though. He could literally be a screenwriter. And he read the story out loud, and we were all like, wow. And then I said, is that the first time you ever got arrested, Lafayette? He was like, no, the first time I got arrested was when I was nine. So why are we arresting nine-year-olds whose mothers are very ill, <laughs> right? So Lafayette's story, you know, is just an endless compendium of these fascinating stories that reveal how and why we need to do things differently. And I'll tell you something like, I, you know, my son, I have a 10 year old son. I would, if you were like, who would you choose to protect your son and make sure he was safe? I would choose Lafayette. I would trust him with my child's life. If you looked at his rap sheet, you might not agree with me, but I know him very well. So when I think about what we want to happen in our communities, you know, you hear a lot of talk about like recidivism. Recidivism is an asinine thing to measure. Recidivism is just who gets caught doing something again. What we need to look at and think about is desistance, which is not something that you hear people talking about. Desistance is the ability of a person to stop doing something that either harms themselves or and or harms other people, right? And there is a lot of research on desistance because we think about desistance in relation to things like substance use disorder, but we could also look at it in terms of interpersonal violence. Like when we look at domestic violence, we don't only want to liberate the victims of domestic violence, we want the perpetrators of that kind of violence to stop doing it. So some of the research around desistance strongly indicates that narrative plays a powerful role. And I didn't know this when I started this writing program or when I, when I wrote my own memoir or when I started the writing program, but actually while I was working in that prison, one of the other people who was, who was doing volunteer work in the prison said, oh, you're doing desistance work. I was like, what are you talking about? She brought me the research. So narrative plays a powerful role in a person's ability to desist. In other words, they have a story, they have a lived history, which 
you know, explains to some extent who they are. And they need to contend with that history and they need to develop a new story going forward about who they're going to be. And for those of you who were here with us yesterday, you know, we talked about James Baldwin. We heard about James Baldwin and he's amazing. And I just wanted to, history is not the past. This is Jimmy Baldwin. It is the present. We carry our history with us. We are our history, but we also have the ability to rewrite our story going forward. And that's the thing that I hope that my students are doing. I believe that they are, you know, Lafayette is home now. He got released in the middle of the pandemic. He survived a terrible COVID outbreak. That prison was the first prison in the country to have a full scale outbreak in March of 2020, but he survived it and he's home and he's doing okay and he stays in touch, which I'm grateful for. But, um, but that question of what we can do to help people change does not dwell in the criminal legal system. I'm gonna leave, I see Larry hovering. <laughs> I'm gonna leave you with one more quote which came directly from the citizen on my tote bag that was in my room. I love a tote bag, thank you. And that is this, uh, this is the thought that I would leave you with, especially when we're thinking about the criminal legal system and who we wanna to listen to and who we maybe shouldn't. It is the first responsibility of every citizen to question authority, Ben Franklin. All right, Larry, you want to take it away for some questions? Yeah, let's get a couple of questions here. I also want to plug Emily's piece in the New York Times Magazine a few weeks ago on the Los Angeles District Attorney, George Gascone, is that right. how you pronounce it? Uh, I think it's the best distillation of the nice. complexity nice. of this issue. So if you haven't seen it, uh, check it out. Thank uh, you. Uh, let's get, we're going to get a couple of questions. We're running behind, but we, we are committed to democracy here where we, we need to hear from people. Um, what, oh, okay. I am very concerned about some of reform's work, which I kind of let you know on Twitter, uh, um, on probation reform. I'm not a lawyer, so, but I have been through uh, the pr prison industrial complex, but worse for me was actually probation and probation. I found it uh, the a maze that I still don't know how I got out of at the end. And the laws in Pennsylvania, which are a mess as they are now, so it would seem that anything would be an improvement, except that the ACLU, et cetera, oppose the changes that reform is making. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, and you walked over before and shared that you were going to um, mention uh, this. And um, and it's I think it's 100% right to uh, support the ACLU. Yeah, I, I um, used to work for the ACLU and have fond memories of my time with the ACLU. Um, the bill that you're talking about is SB 913. Um, and SB 913, um, addresses the harm and the financial cost of probation in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, Pennsylvania probation is one of the worst in the country. And the bill that is, it's a bipartisan bill that's supported by Senator Williams and Baker seeks to address this issue in a number of ways. They actually define technical violation, which is currently loosely, loosely defined and where everyone gets caught, pretty much everybody gets caught up in that loose definition. By narrowly defining it, uh, we believe it's going to have impact. I um, mean, also adjust, addresses some of the jurisdiction issues, because right now, if you're on probation in Pennsylvania, you automatically inherit that you can't go to certain jurisdictions. That is not the case in this current bill. Um, the bill also includes earn, earn credit system, and the part that I like least about the bill um, is that it, it, it brings probation down uh, to three years for misdemeanor, five years for, for a felony. Um, I like that least because, because it needs to be more like two years. Um, that's more the national average, three and five. It's not ideal, but currently it's unlimited. And so you go from unlimited to three to five, so what am I saying? Um, I'm saying that you need advocates on all 
parts of the continuum. ACLU holds the line. Um, there are good people over there. They're holding the line on their side of the continuum. But we're negotiating statewide, and we're negotiating outside of Philadelphia with, uh, with DAs and others that um, would not allow a bill that would be the ideal bill to pass. And so I've been a part of this before, where you have to get what you can get today so you can build momentum and power so you can get more tomorrow. Um, and that's what we're doing with, the, with SB 913. It's, it, it's a good bill. I, I suggest that you read it. Read it for yourself, right, and, and, and see the different pieces of it. Um, it's a good step forward for Pennsylvania. Uh, that's great. Larry? Yeah, one, one last question here. Good morning, and thank you, um, Piper, Robert, and Emily, all three of you for your work. Um, I don't know if all of you were here this morning to hear the mayors, but my question is sort of an interest in uh, a conversation that you two might have with the mayors because they talked a lot about people first need to feel safe um, in their communities. And they didn't talk a lot about the other end of the equation that you all are really focused on in this conversation. What do you think cities and mayors should be doing um, in the space of reform? Uh, you've talked a little bit about the, the, the state level, so thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think they should be incentivizing the behaviors we want. Um, uh, you know, mayors, they, um, they run budgets, right? Like, well, you know, the county leaders run budgets. And I think so much of what we have today came to exist because of the budgets that we have. And so how do we organize budgets to incentivize the behaviors we want? I, I think it's clear. And then the second thing, mayors have a bullet, a bully pulpit, if you will. And so they can use that pulpit to communicate some of the messages that you heard here today. We need them to do that, actually. Actually, I think it's upon us to require them to do that, that don't just feed into the simplistic narrative around crime and around the historical solutions to crime that people are trying to bring back in the forefront. Let's, let's talk about innovative solutions to, the, to this issue. Um, let's talk about the things you heard, the Boys and Girls Club, the interventionists and things. So we need mayors to, to broaden the conversation and, and talk about the complexity of this issue. I, I, I'm told that about $20 million is coming from city government in Philadelphia to community-based organizations. And I asked the person who was explaining that, that uh, investment is that going to go to organizations that are working outside of the criminal legal system or are the, these organizations that are going to be, you know, forced to work within the criminal legal system? And I was relieved to hear that, in fact, it was going to 30 organizations that work that are not housed or, you know, directly paired with the criminal legal system, but rather to, you know, sort of truly community-based organizations. I hope that they are doing some of the things like you might find at millionexperiments.com you know, because I think those are some of the interventions that make a big difference because they empower the communities that are most beset with problems that we all want solved um, to, to do it within the community themselves. And so the idea that you know, some invading army of police officers is going to solve problems in the community is is really not not supported by data or or story. <laughs> um, I love ending here because one of the biggest conclusions um, I hope you take from um, this event and this part of the event in particular is that solutions to these problems are local. Yeah. It is the cities and the counties that have enormous power here. And there are, as an intersection with state funding, and one of the problems is that prison paid for by the state is a kind of free lunch for city and county budgets, just to pick up on your point about budgets and financing. But a lot of the power that determines how, how we intervene, what role punishment plays, what alternatives we offer, those are local issues. Um, the district attorney here, Larry Krasner, I should say my, one of my sisters works for, um, that's playing a role in this. So do the courts, so does the mayor's office, these kind of intersecting local um, sources of power. And there are real opportunities um, in this city and every city to get involved in working on these issues. Most Americans think that mass incarceration has gone way too far. It's a question of focusing on changing it and making sure that it's 
lifted up for politicians so that they know that people think it's important. So um, thank you both thank so you. much. Thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you.